So I want to talk about parliamentary monarchy in England and how that progressed from 1701 to 1901, all right, for this 200 year period, and just go over it very briefly. Okay. So Queen Anne rules from 1702 to 1714. Um, and, and you know, we have the House of Hanover from uh, Sophia, the Sophia line uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, her son, George, is going to become the next king. That all shapes up to be very apparent. Um, and so, but there's some, some, some turning points here in this, you know, sketch of this period that I just want to point out is that Queen Anne is the last monarch to veto an act of parliament. So after 1708, no monarch vetoes a, a, an act of parliament. And that, that's one of the prerogatives of the monarch. You know, the president of the United States has veto power. And presidents quite frequently veto, uh, uh, veto bills that have been passed through both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, the president often vetoes, and even we have something now called the line veto. So they just like cut out parts that they don't like, which is a huge, uh, a huge autocratic uh, prerogative that's given to the president of the United States, not given to the monarch um, at any point past 1708. Um, so here we see that the the executive power of the monarchy is very much constrained. That's a huge thing. So it's it's uh, uh, that's one of the big controls on the legal structure of a government uh, that the executive uh, might have. Then we have the House of Hanover. So these are all, and, and this is just House of Hanover all the way out to Queen Victoria of Victorian England, right, named after her. Um, and that's the period that we're getting up into uh, where Marx and Engels are, are working from London in Victorian England. And, and so um, that's what we're leading up to. Okay, so during this time period of the Hanover uh, monarchs, they, you know, sort of selected, selectively dictate policy, which means that they would issue proclamations um, independently of parliament. So they would institute laws independently of parliament. And that was one of the traditional prerogatives of the monarch, but these uh, Hanoverian uh, monarchs are ab only able politically to do it here and there when they happen to have the political high ground. It's not something that they can do totally against the will of parliament. Okay. so. There we see a weakening uh, of, of the monarchy and its executive power. And then we have Robert uh, Walpole, the first prime minister in 1721. And his uh, premiership spans George I and George II. Uh, so he kind of sets the model for stability of government, uh, regardless of the monarch. You know, Walpole was there throughout the whole business, and he was holding things together in an executive fashion, apart from the monarchs. Okay, so another big change, and then William the Fourth. Um, is the last monarch to dismiss a prime minister, which was one of the prerogatives of, of the monarch. Yeah, I mean, even to this day, the monarch in England um, ceremonially picks and dismisses, you know, the prime minister at certain points. Uh, I don't think that she even ceremonially uh, dismisses them, but 
ceremonially she does pick and uh, and um, ceremonially dictates to the prime minister in, in certain ways, but it's not a, a, a real uh, control over the prime minister. But here we see the monarchy for the last time really asserting control over the prime minister. And from here on out, it's just, that's not a thing. So that uh, from this point forward, much more of a ceremonial role for the monarch. And then Queen Victoria, she's really the last monarch to uh, exercise real personal power. Um, she did retain a prime minister against the will of the parliament. Uh, she didn't dismiss a, a prime minister that was chosen by parliament, but uh, she did retain a prime minister, uh, even though parliament was uh, against it. Uh, that's 1839. So that's getting into this later period that I want to cover. And um, and then later in the century, by the 1860s, um, William Gladstone was a very liberal, um, I want to say that this is even when the liberal party comes into existence, but he was a very liberal uh, in the technical sense. I had you read uh, Paxton um, in that sense of liberal. Um, he, he is a very liberal prime minister and that did not set well with Vic Queen Victoria, who was much more conservative. And um, but she had to accept the premiership of Gladstone. And and that's kind of the final nail in the coffin for the monarchy. And and it's um, and it's, uh, you know, arbitrary prerogatives. OK, so. Um, so I just wanted to cover that briefly to see that this the decline in the monarchy is happening all the while as we're talking about the bourgeois industrial revolution. So these, these things are happening simultaneously. And, and also, and I, I indicated this in the video on class structure at the beginning of the 18th century, we have this pressure from the bottom of the class structure uh, becoming a kind of a, a not kind of but a genuine revolutionary force and I want to show the way in which we have this declining monarchy and this rising bourgeoisie uh, so that the power of the bourgeoisie overshadows the power of the power of the monarchy entirely in the period that we're going to discuss coming up okay <clears throat> 